Okay, it looks like everybody's here, so let's get started. My name is Jim Reed, and I'm one of the Rockworks developers here at Rockware. We realize that some of you have stayed up late or gotten up early to be here, so thanks. We have deactivated everybody's microphone but mine. Otherwise, it's just too noisy. So, if you have a question, please type it into the GoToMeeting dialog, and we'll either answer it right away or address it at the end of this presentation. Now about this outline, I really struggled with how to present this material. Should I describe the modeling and volumetric methods first or approach it from the standpoint of the various types of geologic models? In the end, I decided to present them together because they can apply, you can apply, different techniques to the same data sets. For example, you could use triangulation for stockpiles, but you could also use it use gridding and so on. The simplest method is triangulation, which is useful for stockpiles, ponds and lakes, surface topography and stratigraphy. Let's walk through an example whereby we'll be using triangulation to compute the volume of a stockpile. We start with the hard part, which I'll gloss over, specifically surveying the points and entering or importing the data. The control points need to be saved within Rockworks Datasheet in a row and column format. In this example, the important data is the easting, northing, and height of the control points relative to the base of the stockpile. Now the units that are used for the easting and the northing and the height don't matter. They could be feet, they could be meters, but you must be consistent. You can't mix, say, feet for the x and y and meters for the height. We typically start by plotting the control points to make sure they're in the right place. For example, if the map is rotated 90 degrees, we know that the X and Y columns have been misselected. Next, the program constructs a network of triangles that connect these control points with their closest neighbors. The volume of the prisms defined by each triangle and the stockpile base is then computed and totaled for the entire network. The triangles may also be color-coded in order to produce contour maps and three-dimensional surfaces. The total volume represented by the triangle network is listed in a report that also includes an option for entering a density conversion factor such that the volumes may be converted to mass units. Now, Let's take a look at this process using the Rockworks program. We start by loading up a sample file called stockpile.atd in which we're seeing our x, y, and height values for the stockpile. Next, we go up to the map option, select easy map, and within that we select which columns contain the easting, northing, and the heights. And this way you can have the, your data in any order that you want. And then we turn off and on things that we want to see in the output. In this case, we're going to turn on the network. So if I press the process button, we're going to see the actual, uh, uh, basically a contour map along with the control points here. And that's, that's good enough for a start. But as far as getting the volumetrics are concerned, we need to go over and click on the option labeled Volumetrics Easy Volume. Now here we're going to do essentially the same thing we did with the stockpile uh, in terms of calculating the volume, but notice that the numbers for the volume and the mass or the weight are going to be in negative numbers. That's because of the negative depth. So it's just something you got to remember that you're going to need to take the absolute value of or absolute value of those numbers to have anything meaningful. Okay, moving back to our outline. The next topic is going to be grid models and how they can be applied towards simple stratigraphy. The basic idea behind a grid is you start out with a series of, say, irregularly distributed control points, superimpose an imaginary grid over the project area, and then at the center of every cell within this grid, we estimate a value by looking at the surrounding control points. If we color code those values, we can produce essentially a color-coded contour map, but more importantly, the cells provide a means for computing volumes. Let's take an example of a stratigraphic model. We consider a given unit within this model, 
If we remove the side panels, we can see it is made up of two surfaces representing the top and bottom of the stratigraphic unit. These surfaces are simply three-dimensional shaded elevation grid models. So again, keep in mind, these surface meshes represent the grid elevation models. This slide shows the actual cell values for the two grids within the previous slide. The third diagram shows an isopack or thickness grid that was created by subtracting the lower elevation grid from the upper elevation grid on a cell by cell basis. The diagrams along the bottom depict a subset of the operation where you can read the cell values. In the output grid or isopack grid, if we multiply the east-west dimensions of each cell by the north-south dimensions by the estimated thickness value, we end up with the volume of the cell. Now if we total the volumes for all of the cells, we get a volume for the entire unit. Let's walk through an example using Rockworks. Now we could put in the XYZ data for each and every horizon within a, a stratigraphic model, but there's a much easier way to do it, and that's with this Borehole Manager tool. And this is a relational database in which you put in the different drill hole uh, IDs, then you put in the stratigraphy for each one of these IDs, along with any other drill hole information that you might have. Select the stratigraphy option at the top menu, select Model, click on the Process button, wait a few seconds or minutes, and eventually you'll end up with a three-dimensional diagram that looks something like this. Now, notice that there's a tree over here, basically a data tree. If we expand that and look at some of these sub-options, we'll see that the volume and mass is listed for every one of the units. In a few cases, the volume equals the mass, and that's because we had a density conversion factor of 1. But for some of these, like the Spurgeon formation, you can see you've got 52 million cubic feet of material and 10 million tons of material. The solid or block modeling process is similar to the gridding process, except that we're dealing with three-dimensional cells or voxels. These types of models are useful when dealing with geologic parameters that vary both vertically and horizontally, or anisotropically. To create a block model, we start with randomly distributed uh, control points. We then superimpose a three-dimensional grid matrix and estimate the values for each cell based on the surrounding control points. Let's start with a simple example. Block modeling is well suited for sand and gravel deposits because they are typically highly variable both vertically and horizontally. Block modeling within Rockworks is most commonly based on downhole data. In this example, we have interpolated a block model representing gravel percentages based on downhole gravel observations. The next step in block modeling is to apply a filter such that the voxels or three-dimensional cells that fall below a cutoff level are essentially removed from the model, leaving only what we're interested in. The remaining voxels are then counted and multiplied by the dimensions of each voxel, resulting in a final volumetric number. Block modeling is our most widely used application in Rockworks because it applies to so many difficult types of data, including lithology, geotechnical properties, hydrothermal alteration and mineralization, industrial mineral properties, porosity, permeability, ground geochemistry or groundwater geochemistry, fractures, geophysics, and so on. Let's walk through a geochemistry example using Rockworks. Again, I want to use the borehole uh, manager for doing this type of operation. Now notice we, sh we showed stratigraphy last time, but we also have a tab called iData for interval-based data. This would include things that have a top and a bottom depth, and then various quantitative values. In this example, benzene, uh, sand, gravel, clay, uh, calcium, magnesium. We're interested in the lead values, so I go up here to the iData option, select model, and then I tell it I want to create a new model. I'm going to, I've already set that to be the column that was labeled lead, and I want to create a, a model named lead. And again, I've got some modeling options over here. Um, and finally, I'll go ahead and say process. And we wait a while while the, the program interpolates one of these block models, 
and then we're going to play some games with it. Specifically, if I click over here where it says lead model and adjust the basically the transparency level, I'm saying omit values below a given threshold as defined by this little slider bar. There are two things to notice right now. One is that notice how the model changes as I adjust that threshold, showing me just the values above that point. But more importantly, look here at this, this item where we're showing the actual volume. So as I move the slider bar and look at this ISO level value, which, by the way, an ISO, uh, ISO surface is essentially a three-dimensional contour. But notice that I've got, every, uh, right now, everything above or below 0 0.89209 ppm or whatever the, these units represent is rendered transparent. And I'm also able to see the volume. So watch as I increase that threshold how the diagram changes and the volume also decreases. So if I were to slide it all the way to the right, I'm only seeing these very high values in here, and my volume has dropped way down, as opposed to sliding it way over to the left, where, the, where the, the volume gets much bigger, because we're showing values, or lower values, within the model itself. And now, we move to the concept of hybrid models. Hybrid models simply mean models that use two or more of the aforementioned techniques. In this example, the overburden and bedrock were modeled with grid-based methods, while the calcium carbonate percentages use block modeling. Converting volumetrics to mass is essentially a very simple process. We typically start by removing concentrations or thickness values that we're not interested in by using a high or a low-pass low filter. Then, we multiply the cell volume by a density factor, sum everything, and we've got the mass. This process can become a bit more complex if the density is spatially variable. If that's the case, you'll need to create a separate density model and use that during the volume to mass process. Let's move on to tunneling. Tunneling volumetrics involve two steps. The first is to create a model based on the materials that you're interested in, or the properties. In this example, that's lithology. Here, we have a fairly complex model of dipping discontinuous lithologies overlain by horizontal lithologies and separated from the underlying lithologies by an unconformity. The next ingredient is a tube definition in which the user must create a list of tube endpoints and the tube diameter. By using the tubes as a filter, we effectively remove all of the lithologies outside of the tubes, giving us a model depicting what types of lithologies will be encountered during the tunneling process, as well as the tonnages of the various materials. Last on the list is pit optimization. Rockworks uses a method called floating cones to iteratively optimize and design a preliminary excavation pit such that it fulfills a variety of user-specified parameters. In this example, the surface has been adjusted such that a maximum stripping ratio is maintained. Other constraining factors include ore contaminant grades, bench height, overall slope, pre-excavation topography, and lease extents. A key concept behind many of the features that I've shown is the concept of Boolean logic and Boolean filters. It's not rocket science. We're just filtering grids and solids based on user-defined cutoffs to create models comprised of ones and zeros. By multiplying these models, we're able to perform what is called multivariate modeling, meaning that final volumetrics can be based on an infinite number of parameters that vary spatially. In oil and gas, this could be sand thickness, porosity, and permeability. For geotechnical site characterization, it could be uh, cohesion, compaction, water saturation, and swelling, and so on. The concepts described within this webinar are not proprietary. Many of our competitors are using the same tricks, so knowing how this stuff works will in fact make you a better geologist, even if you're not using Rockworks. Of course, we'd prefer it if you did. Well, that's a quick overview of some of the Rockworks 15 volumetric capabilities. We at Rockware want to thank you for taking the time to watch, especially, again, those of you who got up early or stayed up late. 
We hope that you'll be able to attend more of the upcoming webinars. And thanks again. Bye now.